And so one key lesson I, I got early on was to constantly see what I can delegate off my plate, what I can get yes. other people to do, both in, to, to, to address my weaknesses, but to amplify my strengths. So from day one, I was constantly auditing my work. What am I spending my time on that's either not, not worth my time, someone else could do it better than me, um, or I don't enjoy it. Someone else actually will enjoy it. And then also what, what can be t taught or trained with minimal investment. Hello friends, it's Amy Calandrino and I'm back to you with the latest episode of the Performance Mindset Podcast. After over a decade of advising some of the top business owners and investors, I've met some impactful and influential leaders along the way. Uh, today, I'm excited to have with me William Warren. He is an illustrator an entrepreneur and he spent his career using visuals to help communicate ideas and tell stories. He's the founder and CEO of The Sketch Effect. It's a visual communication company that helps to make ideas understandable and actionable through animation, live event sketching, and infographics. And so some of their clients have included Marriott, Oracle, Chick-fil-A, and Delta, and you just published your first book entitled The Conquering Creative that's already gained uh, the distinction of being an Amazon bestseller. And William lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife, Monica, and three kids, Liam, Gracie, and Preston. And I think you told me one is six years old, one is four, and one's 16 months old. So is it in the order of the names? That's it. Yeah. And we're we're in the thick of it. And so if my thoughts are incoherent or my words are jumbled, then I'm just going to blame my kids. That's the best excuse I have whenever uh, I'm not performing up to the level I would expect. I just blame my kids. So don't tell them. A couple episodes ago, I was with my friend and we we came up with like a new hashtag. And so maybe it's like hashtag entrepreneur parent life. It's, like, mm. it's, 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 it's a real thing. It's a real thing. It is a real thing. We were offline talking about how just reacclimating into reality of entrepreneur life after Memorial Day was quite a, a challenge with little ones. <laughs> of course, yeah. Running a business is one thing, and then running a business, and then also trying to be an active, involved parent is uh, it just adds to the pile. But it's yeah. all good. It's all worth it. Yeah. It's worthwhile. I love it. It's. Uh, as is running a business, having a family, it's an adventure. I wouldn't trade it away, but it's yeah. definitely got its uh, ups and downs. It's not linear. No, but and there's no, there's, there's no one way to, to, to achieve success. However, however you measure it. Yeah. So there's a lot of parallels actually between having a family and running a business. Yeah. I just, that's why I'm squinting my eyes. I'm like, that's interesting. I haven't like ever thought about that too. It's just, it's not as predictable. You can't really plan for it. It's um, it's just a completely different type of life. And the two of them together is, uh, it's magic, right? That's right. <laughs> so welcome to the show. And uh, let's start from the beginning. Like, how did you get into illustration? How did you found your company? You know, tell us about all the things we want to know, know a little bit more about you before we delve into the rest of the questions. Certainly. So I never set out to be an entrepreneur. I never set out to own a business or grow a company. For me, I've always been a creative. Ever since I was a little kid, I loved to draw and sketch and illustrate and make comics. And so for me, that was sort of the that was the career master plan was I was going to become this amazing cartoonist and have these comic strips and draw for the rest of my life professionally. And so all throughout my youth growing up through high school, college, I did comics. I had cartoons in the, the school newspaper, won some awards in college, and then was going to graduate from college. And I was going to begin my amazing, fruitful cartoonist career. <clears throat> well, around that time, the economy was imploding and yeah. the newspaper industry was falling apart. The print industry was falling apart. And so the notion of having a fruitful, thriving career as a cartoonist was uh, not nearly as uh, not 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 nearly as uh, a reasonable career path as it as it once was. Or it looked as it abysmal, once thought. probably. Yes, quite 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 abysmal. I remember I won a cartooning award, <clears throat> and I went to 
the national it was the national association of uh editorial cartoonists conference and i remember mm-hmm. these guys and ladies who had won these pulitzer prizes and uh when they when they gave me my award they said here's your award welcome to the tar pit young dinosaur and i think that's when i realized that my long term career plan needed to change so right. Decided to go back to grad school. I got a master's degree in illustration, but also pivoted at the same time and got an entry-level marketing job, a part-time marketing job at a big company here in Atlanta. And so did those two things simultaneously, both developed my artistic skills further, but also started working behind a cubicle in a desk job with a suit and tie. And over the course of that, of my time spent in that role, um, I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about what it means to run a great company, to offer a great product, to 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 lead a team well. And um, so that was happening. By the same time, I realized that my creative side of my brain or the creative side of my soul was drying up. It was shriveling up because the work I was doing was not necessarily creative work. Um, it was great work, but it wasn't drawing. It wasn't sketching. It wasn't visual. And so my business emerged kind of organically because I started to just draw and sketch during meetings. So I'll paint a picture of it. So we would be in, we'd be in a meeting room with my team, you know, marketing department at this big company in Atlanta. And we'd be talking about some new initiative and I would just hop up on the whiteboard and grab whiteboard markers uh, because I love to draw. I've always loved comics. I've always Mm -hmm. loved visual storytelling I would just sort of sketch or doodle out the notes in throughout the course of the meeting. And for me, that was just a way to have a creative outlet, to have some fun in this meeting. But what happened is people around me saw value in what I was bringing to that meeting context. They saw value in the fact that I was taking these ideas that were being discussed, and then I was depicting them using visual language and icons and concepts and color and iconography and design elements. And soon enough, people around the company start asking me to come to their meetings, you know, different departments, different teams and sketch their meetings. And as long as I got my work done, my boss was cool with it. So I started just to do this sketching, this doodling thing more often. And then the idea of having an actual business out of it emerged when I had people outside of the business ask me to come sketch for their meetings. And so here I was taking PTO. I was taking time off work. I was going um, and sketching for what were now becoming my first clients. And that was just a side hustle for a few months. But, you know, a few gigs later, a few more clients, um, you know, under the belt, I, I realized this is a really cool business concept. And so in 2013, almost 10 years ago, I left that job and started the sketch effect And as you mentioned in your introduction, we are a visual communications company. Basically, we help our clients communicate their ideas, mostly corporate ideas, corporate messaging, but we do it through visuals, through animation, through sketching and meetings, through infographics, through whiteboard videos, you name it. But it all all emerged from just that intersection of my creativity being applied to this business context and creating something that was more valuable. Wow. Wow. And I think about like your work ethic. So you 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 were working and going to school at the same time. And then you decided to, while still working, do the start the business at the same time. So that way, you know, you kind of had as smooth of a transition, you know, as possible. I'm sure it wasn't without any kind of hiccups along the way, but uh that that's a incredible testament, uh testament to your work ethic. And I'm, I'm grateful. We talked about kids earlier. I'm grateful that that season was before kids because <laughs> um, if it was during kids, I don't know if I'd have the energy to, to do it because you're right. It, it takes a lot of energy to both have a main hustle and then also grow and nurture and, 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 and steward this side hustle and then, and then negotiate both so that you can exit the main hustle in a great, in a graceful way, an honoring way, and then ramp up the, the side hustle back to a main hustle. I mean, there were a lot, there's a lot of late nights, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of weekend work, but thankfully it was a good season of my life that I could do that. I could, I could put in that extra bit of effort, that extra bit of, uh, of time and, um, and yeah, make it happen. 
Yeah, I don't know how I would do that nowadays because I really have to recharge my batteries like at night so that I can be handle my work with the level of intensity that I want to and keep after the kids and all the other things that I think could I do it? Yes, but I would prefer not to, not to right. because I mean, there were a lot of um, uh, my story is not too off of yours where I was going to school full time while like working full time and then transitioned out of the main like W2 job into starting this and then, you know, catapulting from there. So I, I can um, relate to that. But I think uh, to do that now would be really challenging to do. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know if I could do it. I mean, I'd like to believe I could, um, especially if I, you know, believe in it and which I did at the time, if I still believed in it and I still had this idea I'd like to believe I could apply that same level of, of intensity and, and, and hustle towards it. But I mean, there's a season for everything. And right now, as we mentioned, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the dad season and yeah. um, you know, want to, want to steward that season. Well, also, you know, don't yeah. want to, don't want to neglect that at the expense of the business. Yeah. So we'll talk about now um, you, we talked about a little bit before we started um, we went on air and um, you're at about 20, 20 ish workers now for your organization or team members. Um, what has like your role evolved from? I, I assume in the beginning you were head cook and bottle washer. You probably did your own invoicing. You probably did oh, all yeah. the business development. You did all the sketching. So you're out getting business, then fulfilling business. But like, what is, uh, how, how's that evolution been? And like, where, uh, where do you kind of spend your time now? Great question. So, you're right. In the beginning, I did one, I made the, the creative product. So in the beginning, yeah. I was the artist, I was the illustrator, I was the animator, I was doing all the creative work. Uh -huh. But I was also doing the sales, I was also in the operations, I was doing the billing, I was doing the finances, the invoicing, reading the PL. I didn't know what a PL was at the time, but I was trying to read it. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> you know, I read, I read, I've read one thing is true about me is I don't I don't know a lot about business just inherently, but I know how to read books and I know how to listen to podcasts. So in the early days, I read tons of business books. And I listened to tons of business podcasts. And so one key lesson I, I got early on was to constantly see what I can delegate off my plate, what I can get yes. other people to do, both in, to, to, to address my weaknesses, but also to amplify my strengths. So from day one, I was constantly auditing my work. What am I spending my time on? That's either not not worth my time. Someone else could do it better than me, um, or I don't enjoy it. Someone else actually will enjoy it. And then also, what what can be taught or trained with minimal investment of both money and time? So from day one, I was thinking, what can I get off my plate? What can I get other people to do? So over the last ten years, you know, we've we've. I hired an operations person. She's now my COO. We now have two other operations people under her. So that's kind of off my plate. Uh, we now have two salespeople. So most of the selling is off my plate. We've hired tons of creatives, animators, illustrators, writers, sketch artists. So most of the creative work is off my plate. And so now 10 years into it, I am in more of a traditional CEO role where I'm yeah. working on strategy. I'm doing some kind of big picture sales. I'm involved in hiring. I'm involved in product quality um, and involved in thought leadership. And that's been one of the things I've been really leaning into in the last year or so in, in the form of uh, in the form of a book I just wrote and a few other things. And, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the roles evolved and sometimes I, I, I wish I could do more of the creative stuff and I, and I have to work out a system to where I'm still creatively fulfilled, but also stewarding the business as best as I can as well. It is interesting. I speak to a lot of CEOs and owners that their company has evolved and, I find, especially if they're in something that's creative, that they still need to find a way to right. to be hands on and and keep that pencil sharpened, pun intended, you know, and 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 um keep flexing that muscle. So, um, do you find that it's just more so active clients that you get to kind of do that for, or you you get to do it for yourself, or? A How little of both, a little, of, yeah. a little of both. So there, I have to have some guardrails because I can't, it's not the best use of my time to be doing right. the cre creative work all the time. 
because we've got other people that can do it. We've got talented team. I want to let them shine and let them do, do work they love. But I do have to decide like, when do I step in? When do I, when do I get my pencil out, my markers out? When do I actually do the work? And so I've given my team some parameters. I'm like, if these things happen or it's this awesome client, or if it's in a really cool city and they want to f- buy me a ticket to fly out and stay at the four seasons in <laughs> Miami or whatever, then like sign me up. I'll, I'll take one for the team and do that. So there's some, there's some parameters around when I want to step in and do the creative work, Yeah, which I've told my team about. Um, but I'll also, I, I'm pushing myself to find other outlets for that creative fulfillment. Mm-hmm. And one of those has been the recent, the recent book I wrote, which yeah. has now been out, out now for a few weeks. And part of the reason I have a lot of reasons for wanting to write the book, but one of them was to have a cre- a chance to creatively express myself again, in a way that's valuable to the business and in a good use of my time. And so that was a great process of getting to pour a lot of my creativity and energy um, into that project. Yeah. And before we delve into your book, um, I'm always curious, you were talking about that you were really into podcasts, books, and learning all these different concepts about business. Was there any uh, books that stand out to you that really helped to lay the foundation for you to grow from? There's been tons. So one of them is the E-Myth Revisited or the E-Myth. Mm-hmm. I think that was originally the E-Myth and it was republished. And most people know about that. It's kind of like the Bible of entrepreneurship. But I read that very early on. And the whole concept of working on the business versus working in the business has been yes. you know, chiseled into my DNA as a business owner. I'm constantly assessing, you know, am I working in the business right now or am I working on the business and in fact, I have calendar blocks where it's like work on the business time yeah. where I, I set aside time in my calendar. Like this is going to be dedicated time where I'm just going to work on improving the business, whether it's making processes or documenting how we do things or improving our marketing or improving our website, like whatever it is. So that was one that was really impactful. Another one that was really impactful was a book called Built to Sell. Yes. Which is really, really good. And it's a short book. It's easy to read. And it's kind of, I believe it's it's told as sort of like a fable or kind of like a in a story. And not that I'm not that I built my business to sell it, but the the concept is that, you know, a good business is a sellable business. It doesn't matter if you want to sell it or not, but a good business will be a sellable business. So whether you want to sell it or not, you should grow it as if it, in a way that would be attractive to a potential um, buyer. And so that one was really good. It was all about ironing out processes and making sure that everything you do falls back to a process. Yep. Um, everything you do from finances to sales, and then in our work to the creative work, which is the really hard part because create creativity is very fluid. It's very, you know, it could be like kind of loosey goosey, whatever, but even our kind of fluid creative work needs to be anchored in some sort of a process. Yeah. So those were two that were very instrumental and there were tons of others. I love books. I'm a huge advocate of reading books. And, um, but those are two that come to mind that were really impactful in the early days. Well, I didn't read Built Built to Sell until just a year ago. Um, uh, the business broker um, that has sold a couple of our family businesses recommended that I read it. Uh, my mother-in-law is one of the reasons I got into owning my own business, but her last two flower shops she had, the business broker sold them and, you know, always loved how great of a business that she, she awesome. runs and, um, interesting connection too. He connected me with the ghostwriter. I'm writing a book too, oh, but cool. um, he recommended that uh, re, uh, to, to build to sell. But I found one of the best lessons in that book was talking about like the discipline and kind of looking at just kind of disconnecting yourself from the business. And you're almost mm-hmm. like looking at it from above, like, what can I do? Because he was finding there was a lot of things that couldn't be really tied down to a business or was costing him too much, like in staff and And I think just being brutally honest with yourself and having that like discipline on what's working, what's not working Mm, is so important as an entrepreneur and to not get so married to that you always have to do things the same way because you were that way before. Right. Yep. That's a good takeaway. Yeah. So, well, let's talk about your book now. So you have some different strategies for helping to unlock one's creative potential. Do you have any 
uh, key insights or techniques from your book that you would like, you believe could have a transformational effect on someone? For sure. So um, the book's called The Conquering Creative. Actually, since we're on a video podcast, I'll show coffee. Uh, here it is. And um, the subtitle is Nine Shifts to Build an Unstoppable Creative Business. So wow. this is a business book, but for creative people. Wow. Um, anyone who does creative work, however you define that, and wants to make money from it, wants to grow a business, wants to be an entrepreneur, wants to have a career doing it, this book is for them. And so <clears throat> I basically took 10 years of my, of the la- I, I looked at the last 10 years of my life And then I try to distill everything I know down to nine key principles or nine key shifts. And, um, you know, I, I don't, um, I, the, the reality, the kind of the main takeaway from the book is that business for most creative people tends to be perceived as boring, scary, and overwhelming. Those are the kind of key traits that I had when I considered business many years ago. It was boring. Like it's not nearly as fun as other things in life. It's overwhelming. Like it's just full of tons of things that are big and I don't intimidating. I don't even know where to start. And then also it's scary, like going on your own, making a living, putting your work out there, hoping it's validated through sales and all that. Um, So that's how I viewed business a long time ago when I was in art school. So back in the day when I was finishing my art degree, that's how I viewed business. And right. it was extremely intimidating to me. And the moral of the story, the moral of this story of the book is that it's not as hard as you think it is. And actually with just some equipping and some encouraging, you can go and start an amazing creative business. You can go and start an amazing creative career. And so it's really written to that type of reader, someone who wants to grow their business, whatever their business is, but just might feel a little overwhelmed, intimidated, or afraid of that process. And like I said, it was a creative, it was a creative endeavor for me. So one thing I love about the book is it's got illustrations on almost every page. Yeah. Literally there there's over 150 illustrations in here that I did all of them. And so it's like, it's it, like I said, it's a business book, but it's written for a creative reader, the type of reader who might normally not pick up a book like the E Myth, or might not pick up a book like Built to Sell, but I'm hoping they'll pick this up because it's it's approachable, it's full of stories. But uh, you asked about kind of one of the key lessons in the book, and the one I'll talk about right now, which is very fresh on my mind, is this idea of building a team. And yeah. the reason it's fresh on my mind is that we are just fresh off of our fifth annual Sketch Summit. That was last that was last week. We we brought our whole team to Atlanta, full time team members and contractors. They're all over the country. We fly them to Atlanta for three days of fun and culture building and learning and development and just good food and good camaraderie. And so when I when I think about when I at the end of the last week, when the when the conference wrapped up and I thought about my team, I just realized I'm so grateful for these people. We could not have built this business without this team. And the team started off small. Originally, I would consider my team in the very first day to be myself and my wife. But it's grown from there. From there, it was myself, my wife, and my first part-time administrative assistant. And then it was myself and my wife and our administrative assistant and our first creative contractor we hired. And then over the years, we've just added on more people and delegated like we talked about, getting stuff off my plate and into the hands of someone else who could do it better uh, than ever than I could ever do. And so chapter eight is all about how do you go about delegating? You know, how do you go about, especially for a creative delegation, it's really hard and intimidating, uh-huh. but you can, but you can start anywhere, even just delegating, like who does your taxes or delegating who, um, who sends your invoices. That was an early one for me that made a massive difference. I spent so much time doing my invoicing and calculating who owed me what and who I owed what. And the second I handed that off to someone else, it was magic. My time was freed up. Our invoicing got more accurate. Our billing got more accurate. Our cash flow improved. So um, that particular chapter is all about how do you go step-by-step systematically delegating stuff off your plate into the hands of your team. And then um, you know from there, so much growth and potential can be unlocked. As soon as you release control and hand off part of your business to other mm-hmm. people, that's when the real magic starts. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I find it in, in my business. I mean, um, I do commercial real estate and I'm still like help to set the strategy and the tone for, okay, what, what is going on in your business? What kind of space do you need? What, what kind of solution can we provide for you? Um, and you just don't know what you don't know. And you, you know, like, do they need to go through a 1031 exchange? Do we need to do, you know, all these different things. And, but then throughout the process, like having different people, like a transaction coordinator and other pieces right. of the mm-hmm. puzzle to make sure things move, move along. I think that that's key. And then you're actually able to just to help what much more people and continue to, to scale. Um, one thing I wanted to go back to though, too, is you talk about nine key shifts and then you were talking about how it was a bit scary to even think about, um, going into business back when you were in, in school, it seems to me though, too, you went, you were more so operating out of a sense of fear and like unknown. And you almost started to go through your first mindset shift back then to even get into the business. Like, I think that probably key is even just having the shift to, to try it. Right. Because even if it doesn't end up working, you, you're you still going to learn something. But I right. think you have to, like, be okay to try it. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in just, in, in kind of just the courage of just taking a step and just yes. taking action. I think that... In the early days, we 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 talked a lot about having a bias for action. In that, you know, even if you take action and it doesn't turn out the way you think, you're going to learn from it, and then you can go and then take better action next time. Or yeah. best case scenario, all your wildest dreams come true. But it all requires taking action. Yeah. And in the in the book, I I talk about how in the early days that action, taking that action was, was, was bolstered by the fact that I, I always had people around me who, who encouraged me. And that's, uh, what chapter three is all about is how do you, how do you, um, how do you stay grounded and anchored to Mm -hmm. like your purpose and kind of who you are, because especially for creatives, but really for any professional, we tend to associate our value with the value that others ascribe to our product or what we, what we do. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a really dangerous place to live long-term. And so in chapter three, I talk about the importance of, of finding mentors, of getting plugged into a community, of setting up self-care rhythms, because I know that for me, there, there, are, probably, there are probably many points along the way where I would have let fear stop me. Right. I would have I would have let fear redirect my professional path to something that felt safer or more guaranteed, but I always had people in my corner, whether it be a coach or a mentor or my wife or friends or my community who encouraged me like, no, William, like you've got a great thing going here. Like, like keep, get, keep, keep, keep on keeping on, you know, don't give up, um, try these things. And then also not just encouragement, but also like advice and tips and, uh, thoughts and new, new ideas I hadn't considered. So I'm a huge, I'm a huge believer in having people in your corner, having your tribe around you um, to encourage you, to give you ideas, advice, mentor you, all the above. Yeah, I, I think it it's key. And you along your journey in business, you end up meeting a lot of same people. And it's it's interesting though, too, is some people that were there like at the very beginning are still there. And then I met other people. Even today, our conversation is through someone I met through business and now it's part of your team. And so mm-hmm. it's so interesting to see that all of all, but I think also it has to do with too, you've always been trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that tends to help to make you successful, you know, over time and continue to build upon that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, as, uh, you know, building the sketch effect, you've obviously worked on a lot of different projects. Is there any of them that you, that are particularly memorable or challenging that you could, you know, talk about and share and, and how you got through that? Yeah, I'll, uh, let's rewind the clock back to 2020. I don't know if you remember that year, something significant <laughs> happened. So our um, our business, one of our core products, I already described it, is this meeting sketching service where we go to corporate events, we go to corporate meetings, and we draw in the room while people are having these fantastic face-to-face meetings. And in 2019, I think we had done over 200 or maybe 300 events. And so wow. in 2019, we had, had a, hit a high watermark. Our revenues were just 
exploding and we had hired a bunch of team members and um, we were all excited for a great, a great 2020. We we're going to have, we had these amazing goals and we we're going to break all these records and have a great year. And then in March of 2020, yeah, our entire pipeline dried up and our entire, every sale we had on the horizon fell through. We had, we had client events that got canceled. As you know, I mean, when every single live event got shut down, our, 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 our pipeline dwindled 80%. So we were running about 20% revenue year over year from March through about July. Um, wow. And then August. And so that was, um, that was a really interesting time. It was a really terrifying time, but it was really, it was a really interesting time because our team, we got together and, you know, we have a, a handful of core values. One of them is courage. We talked about courage and another one is excellence. And we define excellence as hustling and innovating. So kind of the combination of hustling and innovating is, okay. is what produces excellence and then going above and beyond with that. And so I remember that very first week that things were shutting down and we said, we got to do something or else we're going to lose this business because we're not going to have any revenues. I don't want to lay my team off. And so within a couple of days, we created a brand new product. It was virtual sketching. So we didn't know if virtual events were going to be a thing at the time, you know, only a handful of people were using zoom regularly. We we're like, let's create a version of our product that can be applied to this virtual context and see if it takes off. And so within, within a couple of days, we made this product, we made a process for it. We trained our team on it. We made marketing content. We made a new marketing web. We made a new website or new page for it. And then we started promoting it to all of our clients. And we said, Hey, we know your world is disrupted. So is ours. If you happen to have a virtual meeting or you happen to have a webinar, let us know. Cause we can, we can be there virtually and still sketch and still doodle your meeting. It just will look and feel a little different. And so we started to promote it. And then within a few weeks, we got a few sales. And then within a few months, the sales picked up. And then by Q3, it was our highest selling product ever. Um, and our Q4 revenue equaled the entire year's revenue and exceeded it. And so wow. that, that it, like our, our, our revenue for that, that year was like the, 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 the stereotypical hockey stick, you know, just like bottomed out in the, in the spring. And then it started to pick up and then shoot up at the end of the year. And so that was a great story. That was a great story for our team. And we talk about it often in that, you know, how do we not jumped and had courage and try to create this new solution? Who knows where we'd be? Um, but now the virtual sketching is one of our core products. We still sell a lot of it. Obviously, in-person events are back and we love the in-person events. But, you know, that's one of those stories where we had to really put our, our values to the test and our team was really put to the test. And we emerged on the other side, a better business. We emerged a stronger team. We emerged with a better product mix and we emerged knowing that we can, we can take a few hits and, and emerge and, and, and survive. And so just going forward with that, with that courage and that, um, that validation has been invaluable for our team. Well, and it makes me think too, hearing that as you were able to take your team and kind of redeploy them. And because you guys were so singularly focused on how do we fix this problem? They were all able to come together as a strong team. And you're talking about you're on your fifth annual summit. So obviously you've really been working on your culture and you were really in that. So they were really able to kind of come together and focus on that and come come up with a solution to it because they just, they had to do it. There was like no, no, no if, ands, or buts about it. And I, I do find that sometimes in business, you can be distracted by so many things, yep. uh, but then having that singular focus, like we got to solve this problem. And then it ended up being, you know, a great lightning bulb moment that now, you know, insulates you from future in-person events falling apart again. <laughs> right. know? I think crisis creates a lot of clarity. Um, it can oh. create, it can create chaos, but I also think that crisis can create clarity. And so mm. one thing I've encouraged my team is like, how do we, how do we manufacture that clarity? Like we don't want another crisis. Like we don't want another right. pandemic, like no, thank you. Like I've had enough for one lifetime, but how can we manufacture that sense of crisis and that sense of clarity to really focus on what we need to do to grow our grow our business and, and and what we need to do in terms of the right choices and the right actions to take. Um, so we've really tried to, to kind of talk about that and have that kind of mindset going forward. 
Well, that's so interesting. You say that I've never heard the saying crisis creates clarity. That's, uh, you know, I've always thought about sometimes too, like pain, you know, like, let's just say someone like a heavy smoker and they find out from their doctor, like, you know, dude, you're going to like die if you don't change. And then they, they make the changes that they need to make because they're going through this like painful event, but also it's kind of a crisis. And uh, I think then the answer becomes really really clear, but I, I really do like that, that saying, I mean, it, it is interesting. And then how to manufacture that to achieve a result when you're not necessarily going through a crisis. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you plan, how do you plan in advance so that when that, when that crisis does come, it's, it's less disruptive than it, than uh-huh. it could have been. Um, you know, thankfully I, I look back on, I look back on the actual in 2019, we started to, experiment with digital tools and digital sketching. And it was just, just for fun, like just to kind of innovate a little bit. And thankfully our team had already had all the, all those tools in place. So we were able to make that pivot quickly because we'd already outfitted and equipped our team wow. um, with the, with the gear. So, you know, that's just kind of one, one, one kind of also a, a testament to the value of innovation is like, you never know when you're going to actually need it and when it's going to going to pay off. Yeah. So interesting. Well, we talked a little bit about how you're a dad and obviously being a successful career, you know, takes a lot of work. Like, how do you do what you do and still prioritize your time for your family? Do you have any hacks that you use or, you know, how, how do you, how do you do that? So I, um, I'm a big calendar person. I have, I'm a big calendar block person. I love, I live and die by my calendar. And I also live and die by my task management system, which is called OmniFocus. Another book I would recommend is called Getting Things Done by David Allen. The book's, the book's a little wonky, but the, the principles are great. But anyways, I say that to, to, I say that as a segue into that. I, I believe that our calendar reflects our priorities in life. And if it's not on your calendar, then it's not a priority. And, you know, uh, I, I remember when we first uh, got pregnant with our first kid, I asked my wife, I said, you know, what, what, what's, what is ideal for you? Like what, you know, cause at the time, like we talked about earlier, I was hustling, I was like doing 80 hour weeks. So I was pouring everything into it, but I was, I also knew that like, Hey, soon I'm going to be going to be a dad soon. My wife's going to need a lot more help at, at the house what, what is ideal? Like, what is going to be ideal for you? And so we talked about, you know, being home at five o'clock and, and doing 40 hour weeks or, you know, 40 to 50, 40 to 50 hour weeks. And so I blocked my calendar, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to be done with work at this time. And I try to stick to it. So it's a matter of just having firm boundaries on the calendar that everyone knows about. You know, if you look at my calendar at four o'clock, I've got a block and it's like, I'm done at four. Like, don't try to schedule a meeting with me at four. Don't try to, yes. you know, cause I'm going to go home and, um, and I've gotten even more selfish with my time as our kids have increased. So we've got three, like we mentioned, um, cause I want to be available. I want to be there for them. I want to be able to go to their things and, and hang out with them after work and in the mornings. And so for me, it, it all comes down to what's reflected on my calendar, and then, and then protecting that as well. So setting up the boundaries, having it reflected on my calendar and then protecting it. So like, for instance, tonight, I've got a, a daddy daughter date night with Gracie, who's my four-year-old daughter. And so we're going to go and have dinner tonight and it's on my calendar and my team can see it. And so it's like, if any emergency comes up, then it's got to wait, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big believer in identifying, like listing out on paper, what are, what are your priorities in life? Is it fitness? Is it friends? Is it family? Is it personal growth and development? Is it learning? You know, what are your priorities? What do you say you prioritize? And then lining that up with your calendar and seeing if, if they actually match if, or, it, yeah. it, or if there's a mismatch and if it's a mismatch, then, you know, you got to take action to, to rectify that. Um, So like, for instance, I also value working out and going for runs and kind of staying healthy. And so I have that on my calendar as well. I don't protect that as much as I protect my family time because at the end of the day, family does take priority over over the fitness goals I have. But still, both of those things are on my calendar. So if you were to look at my calendar, you'd see my work time and then you see all my other my other family blocks and life blocks. I agree. Um, I you 
I use the calendar too to prioritize. And as I was getting, when I was pregnant with my second, I went through a program called 10,000 Small Businesses. And it was a really good program through Goldman Sachs. And I got a grant mm. to go through it. I basically earned like a mini MBA. Nice. And it's really helped me to grow and grow my business. But I took that class like every day at like three o'clock. And I promised my business coach back in 2012 um, that I was going to, for like basically the rest of my life, I'm going to keep from like three o'clock on blocked off for like strategic planning, me, whatever I yep. do. And I, I pretty much stick to that. Um, and then, yeah, also like I family Fridays, I try to knock off work a little early and pick up the kids and take them to the grandparents and we have pizza and we watch movies and I think you have to have like different disciplines uh, that you that you do to hold it dear. And um, another priority I have is faith. And so like on my calendar, Tuesday night, we're going to go to Bible study. Mm -hmm. And um, if you had asked me a few years ago that if I would be doing that, um, I wouldn't have said so. Because I, I mean, I was working a lot of hours too yeah. before having kids. And um, I think it does definitely shift your priorities. And you want to be a good role model for, for them right. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, how we spend our calendars is a is a is a, a testament to what we actually say we prioritize in life. And so yeah. if it's not on there, then it's not really a priority for you. And so yeah, I think the, the calendar, the prioritization, calendar exercises is, is a, a critical one. Wow. Well, this was awesome. I'm so glad that we got to connect. Is there anything that we didn't have a chance to talk about that you want to chat about today? I don't think so. Yeah, we covered a lot of a lot of great ground here. I mean, if anyone is interested in in the book, The Conquering yes. Creative, it's uh, theconqueringcreative.com. Theconqueringcreative.com. There's a link to buy it. It's on Amazon. So I would encourage people to check it out. Also, if 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 any of your listeners are not necessarily a creative themselves, but they have a creative loved one, like a, a nephew or a niece or a son or a daughter or a friend who's a creative and wants to make money doing their creative thing, whether they're animators or, or videographers or musicians or, or whatever, then I think this is a great resource for them. I know we just finished, we just passed graduation season. So if you have a, a new alum in your life and you think this would be a good resource, I encourage you to check it out for them. And um, yeah, and if anyone's interested in learning more about the live sketching at Sketch Effect or our animation service, which we also do, it's the sketcheffect.com. So yeah. And yeah, how do people, people find check it out. you? So I'm, yeah, you. I'm on, if they want to connect with me, I'm on Instagram at the conquering creative. Yeah. Um, so that's where they can find me. And I post some like business thoughts and kind of just some various things about, about creativity and business and leadership. And so, yeah, check it out at the conquering creative on Instagram. And then also the conquering also has links to some blog posts and some content as well. Awesome. And then, you know, I guess it would be kind of reopening the lid, but how did you do that? Like writing the book and create the time or was it just all about blocking? It's all about calendar blocking. So I started about seven months ago. I started in October and I blocked off in the, in the beginning. I blocked off an hour a day and that's all I spent was about an hour a day writing. And then and then we had we had a deadline which was around graduation. So it just launched last May, or in, it just launched in May. So May second was launch day. And then um, as we got closer to launch day, I knew I needed more time, so I just blocked off more time in my calendar, work on it, and some things had to go. Like you know, I didn't work out as much during those final few months because I was just trying to get this done and working at night some after the kids went to sleep. But um, yeah, it was just a process of just blocking off time and having a, a repeatable process of writing or creating or illustrating in my case, since the book's fully illustrated. But um, yeah, I worked with a great team at Ripples Media. They're the team I worked with on the book and um, got it out into the world on time. And I'm really, really proud of how it turned out. That's awesome. Well, great, great. I hope people connect with you. And um, yeah, I know I'll, we'll, we'll definitely stay connected. And uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in to the latest episode of the Performance Mindset. And let's continue to go beyond and uh, making the difference in the world. And I'm your host, Amy Calandrino, signing off. Thanks, Amy. <laughs>